welcome everybody who's come along tonight. And we're going to win for a treat. We're going to hear John Gallus reading from 17 Paper Resurrections, the pamphlet that we published for him when he won the Brian Dempsey competition, poetry competition, which we run every year um, with 10 poems from it. Um, to introduce John to you, in case you haven't met him before, but I think most of you have. However, John was born in Wellington, New Zealand. He has a BA honours degree from Otago University. He came to England to study for a master's degree in Old Icelandic and Old and Middle English at Merton College, Oxford. On a Com Commonwealth scholarship, he now lives in Leicestershire, where he loves biking, but he returns to our oh, South Island, New Zealand. I cannot say the Maori name, I'm sorry. Um, where he enjoys tramping. John tells us that at the age of 26, he destroyed all the writing he'd done up to them, and he started again. A year afterwards, he won a prize in the National Poetry Competition, and that led to his association with Michael Schmidt and Karkanet, who have published 12 of his books, including The Song Atlas, 52 Euros, and Petrus Worrell, Rhapsodies 1831, which was launched earlier this year, that's translations. And there's another Karkanet book planned in the next year or so. John worked for 25 years at the Leicestershire Student Support Service with, per with, with the permanently excluded young people, spending school holidays in New Zealand and all points to and from, and biking around, mostly around Ireland. He retired early to get stuck into writing and real life. John is an extremely active member of the poetry, poetic community. He is a fellow of the English Association, the Magnus Festival Orkney Poet, the John Clare The Meeting Project Poet, the Sutton Who Saxon Ship Project Poet, and he's a translator of European poets into English with five books published by SLG Press Oxford. He's also a librettist, a librettist for work by David Knotts and Alastair Nicholson. He's a multiple competition winner, and he has appeared and read his work on The Verb and The South Bank, radios three and four. When John entered his 10 immaculate poems to the Brian Dempsey competition, of course, we knew nothing of this, nor of the 27 other collections that had gone out from his pen to the big world. <clears throat> we and Dino Mahoney, the competition judge, simply loved what we read and reacted accordingly. As Bill Manhire, the New Zealand poet, once commented, John Gallus is the greatest New Zealand poet no one has ever heard of. But that isn't true, of course. Of course, after all, he is the winner of the greatest little competition run by us, the most active little poetry publishers in the United Kingdom. This evening, we're going to hear John reading some of the poems from 17 Paper Resurrections and talking about their genesis in the graveyards of Mid Wales and see some of the illustrations that John has created for the characters he found there. We'll also later on hear poems from Pip Osmond Williams, who won the competition in 2021 and whose collection of Valgi and Grief was chosen as their spring choice by the Poetry Book Society this year. And we'll hear from Constantinos, or Dino Mahoney, who judged this year's competition. And whose second collection, The Great Comet of 1996 Foretells, is published this year by Live Canon. So with no more from me, we'll ask John to introduce 17 paper resurrections and read some of the poems. Over to you, John. Thank you very much. Can I first of all say thank you very much for the book itself, which is completely beautiful and amazingly wonderfully produced, and for the two people 
Pip and you know who are sharing uh, this evening. Uh, the, I will introduce this very, very quickly, and I could do it no better way than simply read off the back what it says on the back cover of the book, which explains um, how the poems are written, and then I shall get on. Uh, this series was written after collecting the information given here above each poem from graveyards and churches whilst biking around mid Wales. I have tried with a kindly glow of words to bring these quiet folk briefly back to a possible life. And here is number one, Thomas Christopher Giddens. This is the gentleman who started the whole series off. Um, I found his photograph, found his grave, wrote the poem and suddenly thought, this is a good idea and I like the way it turns out. So this is Thomas Christopher Giddens. Number 13, Clanfair Karenian football team, photograph 1937, died 29th of August, 1998, aged 79, buried in Myford. Tommy's twice as old as God, back to back, like tarnished spoons, he lays with Sister Annie. Stop taking all the earth, she says, and tugs it back about her ears. It is not half time yet. A winter ball bowls along the grass. A team of tree trunks limber up above the crowd. A hundred widows in their underdrawers sat cold beneath the daffodils. The church clock strikes 11. Number two, the apotheosis of John Roberts, organist whose gravestone is in Dolgethlai Cemetery, and he died in 1932, age 70. Bellow, Boom, barum, he is half transported to heaven already at his further furious voluntary, all stops out at Lammas tide. Crack the loft and pipes in twain, take up the seat, the keys and raise the roof. John, John, come to me now with the whole bang shoot a blow. Trumpet thy heart to its end, Ride out through the rafters, pedal past the stars, and into my ivory, infinite ears. Number three, a very small and very sad poem, also from Dolgethloy Cemetery, Private M. M. Pugh, uh, on the gravestone it says, died of wounds, the 27th of September, 1944, aged 19, and his body brought back home. Carts of hay make their way towards the Malach estuary. Day is done. The evening sun frets behind a chestnut tree. The hills are bowed in hoods of cloud. Their skirts are stained with blackberry. The night rain beats along the streets. Come see, my soldier boy, come see. Number four, Sir Moirig, also in Dolgethoi, um, a medieval knight's monument in the church, died 1350. I should explain that the road into and out of Dolgethlai is so damn steep that when I go there on my bicycle I have to walk, um, which explains something in the poem about Sir Moirig being completely unable to get out of the place, being rather old. Sir Moirig. Sir Moirig came to Dolgethlai. At Union Street he was took by a fear of the crossroads, which are called Porth Canal, Upper Smithfield, Owens Court, 
and Feurig's lane, and fell from his jade with a clang. Sir Moirig raised his visor with a little scream. Still it rained with a general vacancy. Here, Nob, said Sir Moirig, we might stand till turn to stone, for I am tired. Sir Moirig did not leave Dogeth life. The road out proved too steep. The nag lost its shoes and its heart. The night rusted to dormancy. He may be seen Capapé flat out in St. Mary's Church on a window seat too small for Nob, under an orange light of lozenged oaks and wheat, wrongly labelled in Ir Finchon of Nanao. Number five, there'll be six in this first little section. Number five, Sarah Elizabeth Jones. This is the most extraordinary uh, gravestone, which just caught my notice for some strange reason, uh, which will become very apparent. She died April the 23rd, 1960, aged 90. And she's buried with her husband, Master Mariner Jones, who drowned 1907, aged 44. And they are buried in Aberdeffy, uh, which means that she was a widow for 53 years. Uh, I should also explain that the, um, the graveyard at Aberdeffy goes down quite a steep hill, across the road, over the sand dunes and into the sea. She explains what she is doing. Sarah Elizabeth Jones. Sarah Jones is knitting the sea. It pearls down from her house on the hill like golden syrup over the lich gate and the road, the marron dunes and the salty 15th green. Oh, Captain Jones, collect thy bones, climb out of the sea and climb the woolly hill to me. I have been alone for 50 years and I am sick of tears. Only the needles click, clack, click. My window and your walking stick. And finally, number six, the crying night of Tuin, uh, a most extraordinary sight if you go to Tuin to go and see in the church. Um, there is a, it's another night medieval monument as you can see from the picture, um, but there is a floor in the stone as you can see in his right eye which gathers the moisture uh, from the atmosphere of the church. And it looks like he's been crying for 600 years uh, and it is often damp. Uh, in my poem, of course, he's crying with happiness. The Crying Knight. Sir Griff galloped at the promenade. The sea was high and wild. Cobb sniffed the hurtling ozone. Ha, said Sir Griff. Tis a sight for sore eyes, eh, my friend? And there they sturdy stood. Sir Griff's plume twattered in the healthy gale. The sun sank in a burst of violet. Goodness, said Sir Griff. The night was full of stars. But who shall say nay to death? Who harvests every nook? The steed fell first, the night conglomerated. Time passed, Sir Griff was born to church on a tractor and laid in a niche where one watery eye of sweet content wells on, unstopped by sleep or stone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Now we're going to hear from Dino, who was our collaborator in, well, she was the prime mover in, in actual fact, in getting the pamphlet printed. So, uh, Dino, would you like to unmute? Oh, wait a minute, let me introduce you. Dino, Constantinos Dino Mahoney is a pe poet and playwright based in London and on Aenar, Greece. 
He won publication of his first collection, Tutti Frutti, in the Sentinel publication, uh, uh, sorry, the Pen Sentinel Poetry Book competition, competition, and his second collection, The Great Comet of 1996, Paul Tells, is to be published by Live Canon very soon. He teaches creative writing at Hong Kong University, and he was the judge for our Brian Dempsey Memorial Competition this year. So Dono, uh, Dino, let's hear some poems from you, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Janice. Uh, lovely to be here and, and many, many congratulations, John, for your wonderful book. I absolutely love it. And it's such a joy tonight to hear you reading the paper resurrections and to hear them resurrected in your voice this time. Fantastic, great honor and pleasure to be here tonight. So I'm in Greece, as um, Janice said, on the island of Aeina, and actually my, my, my latest collection, The Great Comet of 1996 Fortels, has been published. I was in London last week for the, for the launch. As I'm in Greece, I'm going to read some Greek-themed poems from it to kick off. The first one's called Total Immersion. Um, in Greek orthodoxy, when you're baptized, you're put right under. There's no kind of gentle splashing or anything. So the poem's about the memory, because I was six when I was um, baptized in Athens. So it's about that event, but it's also about being immersed in Greek culture. Total immersion. Three days, a continent slips by. Dover, Brussels, Munich, Belgrade, Athens. Mobbed at the station, kissed, hugged, pinched, squeezed. Kostaki, Kostaki, Kardiamu, Chrysomu, my heart, my golden one. We drive off like film stars in granddad's limousine. He takes me to pavement cafes, watches as I scoff honey cake, flicks worry beads as he listens to my Anglo flow. Says he's never met a boy who talks so much. Asks mum if he can borrow me, send me to college, learn Greek. Baptism day, I stand six years tall in a font for dunking babies. Shy, skinny schoolboy in white underpants. Crammed underwater, I surface to a slavering of olive oil, taste sunshine, soil, mum's lettuce salads. Towel dried, dressed, white shirt, blue shorts, choir chanting, hearts crossed up, down, right, left, right, left. Grandad leads me three times round in circles, then gold crucifix flashing out into the dissolving blaze of the cathedral square. Next poem is called Mother Olive. I was asked by a friend who's got olive groves in the Peloponnese if I would name one of her trees. Um, it's a very ancient tree and she wanted to have this naming ceremony. So I wrote this poem for that. And this old tree's got kind of like daughter trees rising up from its roots. Mother Olive. 300 years she's fruited in this grove. Two daughters risen either side her shallow sprawling roots. She remembers their early years as only mothers can in slow sure rings, slender trunks stretching upwards. The autumn their first green droops were shaken from their crowns. She's a ruined castle now, a hollow keep, an open window in her gnarled spine framing sky, her knotty bark dribbled candle wax. Her daughters cannot leave. They will stay until the end, patient nurses at her side. When finally she sinks back into the soil, they will face each other silent across the void. And my next poem, um, My Strachy Beach, it's a beach in the Peloponnese. Uh, we had this medicane, med um, um, Mediterranean hurricane, but part of global warming, these new kind of like phenomena rushing towards us. And a drinking buddy and I went out and we managed to have a few drinks before the storm 
hit and, and confined us to barracks. So it's about getting drunk on a beach before a storm. My Strachy Beach. Near a little white chapel on the rocks by the sea, we sit at a taverna, knocking back ouzo, the trellised vine above us shivering like a Roma tambourine. The gulf churns, mountains of Arcadia mass, storm zorbers on its way. We order another bottle, half-filled glasses, add water, toast the approaching cataclysm with cloudy lion's milk. Three bottles down, we're riffing on death, how to dodge it, review friends' drinking habits, speculate on the state of their livers, fates we deal out lifespans, and order another bottle. When the blues rubbed out of a blue world, what's left? The bleached canvas of beach umbrellas, pale skinned pebbles, tabla rasa of an alcohol rinsed mind. And the next one from that Greek collection here is called Triton's Kiss. Clothes abandoned on the sand, with scything arms he powers out to see the sacred isle of Evia. His stroke breaks on a dolphin's grin, clicking the mammal buffs against his skin, slaps him with a playful tail, spirals down into the deep, rises up with algae hair, rubs jelly breasts against his chest, slips an eel tongue in his mouth, corkscrews down into the deep, rises with a bearded grin, barnacled cerulean skin, gorges on his seafood lips, binds him in a triton's kiss. And finally, I'll read um, some poems about parenting. And the first one is called Hikikomri. And Hikikomri is um, a, a phenomenon that began, it's got a Japanese name because the Japanese seem to record it first. It's when usually adolescents, reclusive adolescents, withdraw from social life and sort of live in their bedrooms. My first sight of him, a sonogram, bald, swollen head, fused eyes, fetal alien attached to a feeding cord. I climb the stairs, tap twice, withdraw. A pale hand slides in the tray. Tethered to his earphones, I do not hear the gunfire, screams, moans, music downloading into him. I look up when the toilet flushes, reassured. And the next one is also on a Japanese theme, it's um, Momotaro, and it's the, the uh, version, in, in English we usually call it Little Peachling, you know, the, the old man who finds the baby inside the peach. Momotaro. A plump peach comes bobbing down a mountain stream, an old hunter wades in and scoops it out. The fruit throbs in his hand. He puts it to his ear, hears ticking, cuts it open with a paring knife. Curled in its crimson hollow, a tiny babe. He spills it into his cupped palm, blows it dry. Tiny cries unlock his heart. Blessed, he eats the afterbirth, wraps his tot in a maple leaf, takes her home. And the final poem is Peace Pipe. And it's about uh, a father who's been estranged from his daughter and he tries to get close to her um, through sharing a bong, you know, smoking hashish together through a sort of a hubbly bubbly. Peace pipe. 
Now, she goes, he sucks hard. The ball seethes. Smoke shoots up the stem, down his throat, fills his lung. He tries hard to hold it in. <coughs> Goths. <coughs> Chokes it up <coughs> in racking spasms. <coughs> she laughs. What's he like? He hopes this will bring them together, sharing a smoke, having a laugh. Out the window, he sees people queuing at a bus stop in the rain. He counts them, five, six, seven, the years they've been apart. He asks what she remembers. A film you made me watch when I was six. A man gets eaten by ants, everything except his glasses. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's a sad ending. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dino. That was wonderful. Um, now we're going to go back and hear some more from John. Uh, four of these little bunch of five are all from Corris, which is the little village that I stay in each year uh, for a week or two um, to do what I've just done. Jane Ann Jones, this is a, a study in boredom. She was the wife of the uh, police officer in Corris, which probably at that time had a population of about seven or something. And she died in 1915, aged 23, of the police station Corris. The fowl was cold. The leaves fell fast. Wells's heifer bucked its chain. I think I'll go for a walk, said Jane. Snow slipped down the gutted slate. The Robertsons lost a window pane. I think I'll go to my room, said Jane. Daffodils choked the waving grass. Evans's boy got drunk again. I think I'll take to my bed, said Jane. The heavy curtains blushed with heat. Flint, the magistrate, missed the train. I think I'll pass away, said Jane. Number nine. Uh, Jenny M. Richards. Who died April 29th, 1919, aged 12. Uh, the daughter of John and Deborah Richards of Corris. Uh, the refrain in this poem is actually engraved on the gravestone. Deborah laced looks at the rain, John pats his organ, flat as a punctured tire. A spider tours the Dutch fruit bowl. God called you home, it was his will, but why so young, we wonder still. Jenny sits in her grave, wearing a white shift and playing knuckle bones. Dandelion clocks whir in her curls. God called you home, it was his will. But why so young, we wonder still. Fires crack their loaves and flare in grandma's matching mirrors. Rain bows the ferns by the stream. God called you home, it was his will. But why so young? We wonder still. Number 10, a very stirring poem. Evan Jones Williams, who died August the 27th, 1900, age 23, quote, in the heroic and victorious charge at the Battle of Bergendal, South Africa whose body was brought back to the little village of Chorus. So the poem is about him 
being inspired to go in the first place from this very small place. Dark and wet beyond the window, by the life, light of a paraffin lamp, Ev is reading the bugle. Cannibals tiptoe round the hooky rug. Upright Edward works on a farm. He is noble and strong. He never tells lies. Oh, mother and father dear, I am going away to fight for the queen. God go with you, they say. Snow slaps round the chimney tops. Ma is done. Pa is bent over his book of flags. Injuns sneak along the curtain hems. Edward can ride, Edward can swim, he charges at terrible men in shorts. He is shot down in treacherous wise, but glory shines in his eyes. The dark river splashes down Bridge Street. Ev looks into the fire. Martians land in Aberystwyth. The coals clatter in scarlet flames. He says, take up my lance. He cries, take up my flag. Bedtime, Ev. Don't forget to say your prayers. And the angels come down the stairs. Number 11. This is my favorite picture. Um, although, of course, it's very sad. Eleanor Charlotte Lloyd, who died February the 9th, 1840, aged nine weeks. Daughter of John and Eleanor Lloyd, Drapers of Chorus. And it's the being the child of a draper upon which the poem uh, hinges, I suppose. The saints leaned out on their bars of glass. Something at five o'clock. Is it a bird? says Irene of Antioch. Is it an aeroplane rowing ever upwards in a salvo of talc, trailing thus tucked swaddles of finest muslin and lawn, both voluminous and long, carefully trimmed with sails of satin and stitchings of treadled lace and a calling card for the drapers at Lanbarden Road, pinned to its baby breast? Nay, said St. Florence of Garegadu, as the bundle shot out of the void. It is little Eleanor Charlotte Lloyd. And last one for the section, number 14. In much the same vein, being the daughter of a cabinet maker, Susanna Morgan has brought uh, a father made coffin ready made with her to heaven. Died 16th of July, 1816, aged 17. The daughter of William Morgan, cabinet maker, buried in Aberystwyth. Susanna Morgan has brought her coffin. Papa made it for me out of a maple tree. The angels agree, it is a beauty. Papa said when I was dead that I should sleep instead in this whatnot bed in the freeze of weeping willow with the carven lark for a pillow. The angels say, my dear, of course, it is a tour de force. Says Susanna, where is my room, pray? And the angels shoulder the closet and lead the way. Thank you. Thank you, John. Lovely. And we're going to pass swiftly on to Pip, Pip Osmond Williams, who was the winner last year of the same competition. Her pamphlet using the poem from her entry was titled Of Al Algae and Grief. And it was chosen by the Bib Poetry Book Society as their spring pamphlet collection this year, uh, choice rather. Pip works for the Scottish Literary Her Heritage Trust, I think that's right, in Edinburgh. Anyway, she'll put me right, if not. Thank you, Pip. Let's hear from you. Thanks, Janice. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm in Glasgow, but um, almost, almost there with the title. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's, I'm a real graveyard enthusiast, um, so I've been loving these poems, John. Um, 
and yeah just I love the idea of um bringing these people and giving them a second life I think that's just wonderful um especially I love that opening line of the Sarah Sarah Jones is knitting the sea I think that's wonderful um so yeah very much enjoying the evening so far um I'm going to read a couple of poems from my little pamphlets from last year um and the first one is called Migration and um, there's quite a lot of birds in this collection. This is kind of about bird migration, but also the kind of like hope that comes that comes with that and the cycles. Um, so yeah, this is Migration. That first summer, we mistook their bodies for shrapnel. The second, their wings for a shiv. We lost faith in flight, forgot to seek hope in the shape of a bird, calling our names from the prayer wall to the west coast, swift and fleeting. We let slip what it's like to come home again, somehow fear it. A test, of course. That year, the earth bound our bodies quietly to its own. We did not feel it, but salt blood became sea foam, murmuring wet lines of swell and retreat. The windows were open, something returned, brown bellied, in a frenzy and drift. It looks like survival, or celestial cue. It sounded like wings drumming in the north of the house. Um, the next one I'm going to read, um, I actually chose it because there's a Welsh link, um, and I, you know, I thought it would go with the theme, although it's not a particularly positive Welsh link, um, so apologies for that in advance. Um, this poem is called Tenu, um, who was a legendary 6th century Britonic princess, um, whose father, who was a Welsh king, the link, um, pushed her from the top of Traprain Law, which is kind of a hill in um, East Lothian, um, as punishment for her being raped. Um, but she survived through divine providence, um, made it across the Firth of Forth um, with the help of an Orcadian, Orcadian, Orcadian saint um, and gave birth to St. Mungo, who's the patron, patron saint of Glasgow. Um, so yeah, this is a tenue. On the shivering edge of Traprain Law, I begged him to push me. I pleaded with the cliffs to offer me their salvation. Make me weightless. Let me become again a part of the earth and sea from which I came. The gannets and kittiwakes can take me. Or just let me wake up hidden within the silk quarter skin of a selkie. By starlight and peat flame, I wanted to be shrouded in the mist that would make me legend, a whisper, untraceable. Rather that than have them ever touch me again. In water, even the slough of a snake bears a heavy weight, but on willow rods I took to floating. Endless days I spent, cast under the swell of the sea mother unfolding the length of myself to the cacophonic call of gulls. In blood-soaked evenings of the aurora, I heard the battle cries of my sisters in the wind. And I dreamed about tsunamis, the end of things, the underbelly of an elephant. From the velen depths, I finally forced myself from the firth dug my nails in the gasping land and grasped the hand of Surf, the crutch of him, who whispered old Orcadian psalms into my burning, bleeding ears, and with a burr I felt you breathing. Then my skin was not theirs, but mine again. How I swam into the caves of it, reaching a throne of peach and blood in the seat of which a baby slept.
In Casieras, by the banks of the Clyde, I think often of the looms of time, the black moon seed and the rocks that cradled me, the jagged edge that made me again half ocean, half sky. From my sheltered breast, you fix your tiny eyes and tripping law ablaze in kerosene. One day, I'll sing you a lullaby of a cliff top and a mother. Empty furrows, I'll croon to you, where the water once ran to save me. Um, I actually wasn't going to read this one, but um, I just thought because Dina was doing all of his Greek poems, I thought I've actually got quite a lot of Greek mythology in here, so I'll do one, do one of those. Um, so this is Midas, um, about King Midas, but from the perspective of his daughter and, yeah, I guess his kind of obsession for gold, um, being told through the narrative of addiction. Um, so, yeah, this is this is Midas. In his garden, we would count the colours. Pink lemonade, sweet briar rose, the flesh of a cantaloupe. Every time I fall in love, I see my father's hands dripping butterscotch and boysenberry into the blind baked and sweetened earth. Before gold, before the finch became the eagle, before the wool became the fleece, before the tremors, begging, sweating, clawing. We practiced father-daughter dances among the wildflowers, <clears throat> shoulder to shoulder, palm to palm, then cheek to cheek. The doctor gives him pills for the pain, salt water for the ache, but Christ, I know the craving keeps a different clock. Within the doll of him, there's another one, another one, another, and he pulls out their hair <clears throat> with shaking hands. He only knows love as lingering, longing as tangible. Father, father, let me weave you a dress of thirst and grief. You will know loss sitting in the citadel, spinning silk from particles, threading webs of gold that only you can touch. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna end on um, harvest because it is almost plum season. Um, so yeah, this, this is my final poem. Thank you for having me, John. Um, this is harvest. You think you saw a murder in the gloaming. Corvids teaching their young the hunger in the dying. So you bring to me our last harvest. Let me learn patience watching you unpeel jam jars sticky with fruit. A slow bloom that turns our thighs to bruises. Berry wine, tart and cool, slipping neatly down the throat. You take out the final holy glory. A bowl of plums, almost fit to bursting. See how they yield at light pressure. We devour their soft flesh slowly, knowing that when you have licked my wrists blue clean of juice, the stones no longer pitted with our blood. You will leave me digging dirt beneath paling thrift and sheep sorrow. The last of the summer, you and your black pinions, wing flight making light of flesh and bone again. Thank you very much, Pip. They're very layered poems. Thank you so much. We're going to have one more session with the Welsh graveyards. And so, John, I'm going to find my screen share again. 
and we'll go oh, on 16. to your last last poems. Uh, I always forget where to find it. Excuse me. There it's just up. 16 and 17, the last two. There they are. That's him. Uh, the Reverend Azariah Shadrach died 12th of January, 1844, age 69. And the quotation on the gravestone says, Minister of the Independent Church, who preached for upwards of 50 years and finished his course in joy. Buried in Trefechen. One cold night, a little swallow came to the preacher and said, Now you are dead, Tulu. We must find you a rightful place in the kingdom of infinite grace, if that is what you desire. It is, said Azariah. Here and there they went to a room full of trumpets and willows white, where a motley of saints embroidered light. And the little swallow said, would you like to go higher? I would, said Azariah. They walked in the sky to a chapel of iron and knocked on the red hot door and the preacher said, now let me in for I have been here before. And the swallow said, would you like to go into the fire? I would said Azariah. The preacher's frock coat bloomed unburned and the flames sang as he went into the fiery firmament. And the little swallow said, do you wish to stay here amidst this combustible choir? I do, said Azariah. And finally, Mr. William Barry, or should we say Captain William, it's a wonderful picture, isn't it? Um, William Barry died December the 15th, 1886, age 61, captain of the schooner Idris, also buried like Sarah Elizabeth Jones in the steep um, graveyard at Aberdurfi. And inscribed on the grave is, is a, a very common uh, little phrase that's put on to warn you who are reading the stone that it will be your turn sometime soon and by surprise, which is, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. I have climbed your blasted rigging, says God, to tell thee Thy watch is done. I saw ye, says Captain Barry, in my salty glass. God billows. Is it not, he says, an hour that ye think not? December the 15th at four? Aye, lower the main brace, says Barry, and give my soul to the sea as the hunter returns to the hill. God slaps in the canvas. He tops the mizzen. Come, he says. He balloons in the glass. So it be my will. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Let's all give you a, please unmute everybody and let's give John and Pip <laughs> And Dino, a bit of a clap. Cyber clap. Thank you, all three of you. That was lovely. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, now, we, we, uh, we always say, would anybody like to ask mm. any of the readers any questions? And all, always there's dead silence after that. So uh, I'm going to ask John, you've seen, you've seen the everybody, you've seen the the pictures. We were quite surprised when we got the pictures because what we what we'd received and, and rewarded was only words. But there came all these lovely pictures, and we couldn't resist them. I mean, it, it expanded the pamphlet into uh, more more pages than we'd been expecting. But it was worth it. Um, John, what what made you decide 
how did you find the pictures for a start and why why did you feel that they were really really necessary the um, it all began with the with the very first one the tommy giddens one um, because I actually, through a series of extraordinarily spooky uh, coincidences, which I can't go into because it would take far too long, um, found his photograph um, after visiting his grave in a uh, photograph of the Flanfair Carinian football team. And I had the picture besides a poem, and I thought this, is, this works really well to actually, it gives the extra... I don't know, it seems a strange thing to say, an extra physical element to the resurrection. It, it makes it more, um, more solid. It makes the flesh more solid to yeah. bring them back to life like that. Yeah. So I thought after that one, I would actually get rid of the real Tommy Giddens because it would be impossible to find the other 17, um, you know, the real people, photographs of the real people. In fact, I never found one of any of them ever. Um, and I thought that, I would try and find a picture, starting with Tommy, that looked like how looked most mm. like how I had reimagined the people. Mm. Yes. So it's many many hours of search through Google image search, uh, and also avoiding everything that wasn't um, what's it called public publicly available, not copyrighted. Yes. Um, which often led you to find things that were in the public domain, didn't you? Yes, yeah, which often leads you into quite interesting um, sort mm. of little side roads you wouldn't have thought of before. But I'm very happy that I ended up in every case with something very much like what I had written. Mm. 